Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of FaceTime with Todd Wharton. I'm your host, Todd Wharton. Hope everybody's enjoying this beautiful day outside. Uh, it's beautiful, definitely here in New York City. I mean, right now, I think it hit like 70 degrees, and it was a little raining outside, but, uh, you know, it's all good. We're having a good time out here right now. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to welcome my studio audience that's coming in, my virtual audience. I'm so used to saying studio because that's who I'm talking to right now is some studios, which I can't divulge. But we've got to get into that in a little while. Uh, let's uh, get into some uh, topics let's talk about. Uh, first of all, uh, reality check. That's obviously a new segment I added to the show. So let's talk about reality check. Tonight's subject is going to be reply to messages. Um... I'm trying to figure out why people like, you know, I didn't get your message or sorry I didn't get back to you. Let me let me just cut this out right now, okay? The average person, they say, checks their phone about 150 times a day. 150 times a day. That's a study, okay? So today when people text you, email you, call you, Facebook you, Instagram, LinkedIn, I honestly do not want to hear that, uh, you know, I didn't get your message. Sorry I didn't get back to you. Listen, it's, it's kind of an insult to a lot of people because if I text somebody, even if they don't have the phone on them, and I have some friends that are really good at it, um, when they get the phone, they'll see me call and they'll be like, hey, listen, I can't talk right now. Can we speak tomorrow? I have a really busy day. Not a problem. Want to know why that's so important? Because you're responding to the text or call, email, whatever, but you're also keeping them in the loop instead of keeping them in the dark. That's what pisses people off the most is when you don't respond. It's a respect factor, okay? And uh, a lot of this needs to stop because even if you don't have an answer for the person, just respond. That's all you got to do. Just respond to the text. And then it's simple. But a majority of people I'm finding out don't even respond at all. And I don't know what's going on anymore. It's kind of like the art of communication is pretty much done. And uh, that's why I'm saying, guys, all I know is if you have a phone, email, Facebook, whatever, somebody hits you up, even if you don't have the right answer, just respond. It's common courtesy because you got to learn when you do that and they do that, better conversations are to come about. It. And that's what I'm saying about that. Uh, in the meantime... First of all, I do want to tell you guys about a couple of things that are coming up that I think you guys should definitely know about. Uh, first of all, my man Hector Macho Camacho Jr. is fighting Cesar Julio Chavez. Julio, I can't even talk tonight. I got like some in my throat. Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. in June, which is a big, big deal. June 19th in Mexico. Hector Macho Camacho Jr. versus Julio Cesar Chavez in the main event. And in the title card below that preliminary is going to be MMA fighter Anderson Silva versus Cesar Jr. That's right, Julio Cesar Jr. So that's going to be a pretty cool fight. Guys, check that out. It's on pay-per-view. And that's going to be on June 19th straight from Mexico. And it's going to be the Battle of Puerto Rico versus Mexico. It's going to be a pretty cool deal. Um, I also want to give a big shout out to the wise guys um, and thank you to Freddie Tenor. Uh, Freddie is a really good friend of mine, great guy, and uh, he's the reason why I'm speaking to this um, entertainer that we have tonight. And he's a great comedian, and we're going to bring him on in a little bit, and we're going to chop it up. Very, very well-known comedian, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, speaking of the wise guys, by the way, if you want to check out that show, uh, Wise Guys Show is live on Facebook Live and also their Facebook group, which is known as the Wise Guys Show. And it's their page or their group. They do uh, their show every other Wednesday night from 8 to 10 p.m. And they usually post a lot of their information in the Facebook group. So guys, check out the Wise Guys Show with the Ness. Ends with the Z. All right. So that's my boy, Freddie Tenor. So coming up in a little bit, we're going to bring it on right now. It's my man, Mike Marino. So well, you, you guys want to check this out while I bring them in. The Italians were on television in the movies where they make us play. He is the Italian. And all they ever wanted to play was a mob boss and a mob movie. And that been intuitive. And in both of them, I was the Irish cop without black in the first 60 seconds. <laughs> the Italians on some better show. You guys remember the movie The Sixth Sense? That would have been a good place for an Italian act. 
because that little kid would have been considered a rat. <laughs> Think about it, like, I see dead people. Shut the fuck up, you see nobody. <laughs> All right, guys, let's welcome world renowned comedian and my fellow Italian, Mr. Mike Marino. How you doing, brother? I'm doing all right. I hope I'm coming through okay. <laughs> you are coming through perfect, and I appreciate the Wi-Fi is perfect because I love all my guests, but sometimes they don't realize when they come through, their Wi-Fi is so bad, I feel like I'm talking to the robot the lost in the space. <laughs> it's like, I can't even understand them half the time. And, um, yeah, thank you for coming on. And as I said before, I'm thanking Freddie because one of the things I always do is um, people that refer people or even managers that hook up their clients or anything like that never get a thank you. <laughs> like, I don't even understand that. I thank everybody. I guess that's the Italian in me. My mother raised me to thank people always because she always believed in the karma and it always come back to bite you in the ass if you don't thank the people that take care of you. You agree with that? Absolutely. Freddie Tenor is a great guy. He's a world-renowned fireman, especially here in New Jersey. And now he has a great talk show, The Wise Guys. Fantastic. That's right. I've been on The Wise Guys show. We had a lot of fun. And uh, sometimes I like going back out to Jersey. My mother's from Scott Plains. And then You're I was kidding. part of Power Beach. Yeah, Scott Plains when my mother grew up. Yeah. I'm in Scott Plains right now. Oh, my God. So, all right. So, this is the test right now. When I was a little kid, my mother brought me out to my grandma's house. She she um owned a, she owned a big two-story home that's across the street from the uh, church that does the Italian festival every year. Okay? Yep. She was the big home on the corner that sold. She's directly across with the porch, the old school, everything. Now, what I didn't like was when I drove to Scotch Plains every year and I'm a kid, there's a, a little park with a pond, but there's that little hill <laughs> that goes up. And my father always liked to drive really fast and get me sick because he knew he got me sick. And one day I, I ate and I got so sick, I puked all over the car. <laughs> and it was just like, that's what reminds me of Jersey all times when I go over that hump. So how do you like New Jersey? How do you like Scotch Plains? I grew up in Scotch Plains. And I'm sitting on the set where I do my podcast live from my mother's basement, which I'm in the real basement I grew up in. I've been in this house since I'm seven years old. I bought it from my mom and dad about 20 years ago so that they could live here and I could take care of them. And you're talking about the church, which is St. Bartholomew, St. Bart's. Right. And that's where I went to catechism. That's where I went to Catholic, uh, you know, teachings on a Sunday. And that's where we went to the feast every year. At the end of That's the summer. Right. And I probably walked by you, but of course I didn't know who you are. And my mother always wanted me to get the 50-50 from the guy with the big ass tall hat. That oh, yeah. Walk around the whole time. Yeah. And you know what's oh, really funny? Goodness. I think the house that you're describing belongs to Pat Denizio, who was the lead singer in the Smithereens. Oh my God. So he's the guy that bought it. Yeah, it, it what it was is it's a two-story home right on the corner, old, old colonial. But then they also owned the home right behind it as well that her niece was living in. So it was, it was kind of like a two-shot deal when they sold the home. Which well, as really far cool. as I know now, that big house that you're talking about was from the late 1800s. It got knocked down. Yep. There's two big, beautiful new houses there now. Oh, uh, I honestly didn't even know that. <laughs> oh, my God. It's a legacy home. And they named yeah. the street after Pat, Pat Denizio Way. Wow. Oh, this is awesome. Now well, I'm the even... guy's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know, he's a legendary guy. Yeah, and now I'm even even more happy. I was so happy to have you on. Now I'm even more happier because I'm learning about my heritage, my history of a house that I grew up in. And when you talk about Italian food, people don't understand mothers can cook. But when you have grandmas cooking from the person that taught the family, oh, my God. And... I was watching one of your things, uh, Italian Feud, uh, I think it was Italian Feud, or The Last Supper, Last Supper. Yeah. When you were talking about how your mom cooks. And people don't understand. The one thing I kept laughing, because when you said your mother always cooked for people that weren't even there, yeah. <laughs> and it's so true. I couldn't stop laughing because all I picture was my grandmother just like gravy up to here and pots and pots and pots. And you would never know I'm Italian because I have a Jewish last name because of my father. 
But uh, everything I was watching, it was hilarious, man. You are so funny. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, you know, laughing. the truth is always funny. And it's funny that you're describing what you're describing because I'm still in that basement. I wish my mother was here. I wish those pots and pans were filled with gravy, brajol, and meatballs. It's just not that way anymore. So I decided to move back into this area and create a TV series about my life growing up in this tiny little town of Scotch Plains. And that's awesome. And you know what? People don't realize some of the best shows out there is shows that are completely honest and about your life. And it's cool that you're doing it in the basement, kind of like a Wayne's World type of thing, but in an <laughs> Italian term. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you're and right. That is, and that's really, really cool. And I, yo, you know what you should do? I'm, I'm throwing it right out. Because I love a lot of your skits that you do on making Italian great again. That would be kind of cool on your show if you do a skit of Wayne's World, but in the Italian sense. <laughs> that's a great concept. Wayne's world. No, it's not. It's my world. Now get out of my house. <laughs> exactly. I think that would be awesome. So now you got two goombas going at it in the basement, arguing with each other, and <laughs> like you have a bad guest on. I would yeah. definitely watch that. I think that would be hilarious, and I think you're the guy to do it. Well, yeah, maybe you'll have to come down the basement, hang out with me, do my podcast on a Tuesday. And uh, I do a variety show on a Sunday night, the last Sunday of the month, called The Not-So-Late Show. And I have characters come on the show. I have singers come on the show. We've been having some fun. And uh, all created because of the pandemic. So maybe when it's over, we'll go back out on the road. Yeah, I would definitely love to do that. Uh, you've already seen I do pretty much everything. Uh, that's why one of the reasons why the show has been taken off, because of the uniqueness and when it comes to characters yeah i'm more than happy to come through and do it it's you know it's so funny uh, if i could say this right now yeah i hope you could see me because you're frozen you've been frozen the whole time we were talking i can't even see your movements or anything like that i wonder why that is but am really? i coming into you okay you're coming in perfect and i'm moving perfect too everybody on here is seeing me i don't know maybe it's your connection in the basement probably <laughs> that's that's, uh, that's kind of weird. So, well, at least you can hear me. Um, I can no, hear but, you. I can see your face. And if everybody who's chiming into the show right now can have a good time with us, that's great. If you want to do something right now, nobody's going to leave. If you clock locked out and then chime right back in, I'll bring you back in. Let's see if that works. Maybe it's just a bad connect you had. I wonder how you do it. Just hit that big X. Yeah, just exit the uh, yeah, hit the X, and then go back in on my thing. All right, we're going to bring him right back, guys, because you know what? Technology, it happens. You know, so let's uh, bring Mikey back in here, and uh, we'll go live again. And let's see if that works for him. Sometimes you live by tech, you die by tech, but, hey, you know, that's how we do. How's that? Better. <laughs> see? So I'm going to let you know a little something. I tell some people this, and I should be talking about it more, but I don't. I'm a big tech guy. Um, if you know Logitech, the big computer company with the mouse and keyboards. So my brother's one of the CEOs for that company. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's my brother. You're so, kidding. Uh, yeah, no. So the little Nas X commercial during the Super Bowl, my brother was involved with that. Um, so when it comes to technology, just ask. It's, technology is kind of weird. It's great. But sometimes you got to deal with it, it freezes. But the easiest sometimes thing is to shut it down, pop it right back up, and you're good to go. It happens. Oh, wow. You know? Holy smokes. Yeah, he says good. Logitech, and there it is. <laughs> that's right. That's right. See? And I did not give him that prop, everybody. I'm just letting you know. He automatically had it. He automatically had it. So let's uh, chop it up. We're going to have a lot of fun. Um, first of all, um, stand-up comedian is not an easy job. Um, at all. I mean, I hosted some events at the Broadway Comedy Club because Al Martin is just a really, really good friend of mine who I had on. Uh, I think it was my first week I started this show. And when I hosted a lot of people from Bob Levy um, to Phil Kors and Pernell Holloway, Angel Salazar, and the list goes on. The one thing I noticed was is that you could be the funniest guy in the world, but you also have to be somebody who can adjust to your audience because you have to read them within five minutes. And if they're not feeling you, you may have to have a plethora of jokes. 
that you may get to them. How do you approach an audience? Because your comic routine is hilarious, right? But if you ever approached the audience where it wasn't feeling your Italian routine, has that ever happened? Yeah, you, I have uh, about maybe three hours of stand-up material and I could change it on a dime. I could tell by people's body posture. I could tell where neighborhood I'm going into, where I'm going. Is it a corporate event where people are going to be uppity? It's down and dirty. You're in the hood somewhere. Um, you get, you've got to really get a grasp on everything and anything that you possibly can if you want to be able to entertain any market. And I'm talking children, teenagers. Mm -hmm. Teenagers could be the worst market. And then you got guys in their 20s, 30s, people 40, 50, 60. Uh, one of my last shows, a lady came to see the show. It was the second time coming to the show. She just turned 100 years old. Wow. Now, why would this lady come? Because she just loved the fact that I was talking about the way things used to be. And she adhered mm -hmm. to it. And why would kids want to come to the show? Because everybody got an affection for wise guys from New Jersey or New York that sound like, hey, how you doing? Right. So I always made it a point to make sure I didn't fail in any market. And I really don't do anything offensive. Some people could get offended by the fact that I will call you out on your crap if you get in my face while I'm entertaining. And that's yeah, that. Exactly. And I'll, I asked Bob Levy this also, um, and Michael Winslow, same question, because it's a good question to ask comedians. Are you finding right now that comedy is getting a little harder because in the past year, the sensitivity level has went from here to here, yeah. right? It seems like nobody can joke around anymore. And li listen, I have a lot of nationalities. Like I'm Italian, most, mostly Italian, but because of my father, he's got a little Russian, a little Polish, and a little Jewish. And when I heard a lot of jokes, you know, I laughed. We all laughed. They're funny. But are you seeing that a lot more people are just taking it personal when it's not supposed to be taken personal? It's a joke. Right. Are you finding it might be a little harder for you to do what you do? It's going to be. Yeah. For a little while. But people like that, you know, you really feel like saying we got names for. Maybe they shouldn't be going to comedy clubs. What they might right. find funny, you might not find funny at all. And then there are people who don't find anything funny or joyful in anything. So I tell right. those people, eat a prune, take a crap, you're backed up, let it out. Because <laughs> I don't care. Now, somebody just wrote right now, a fan of mine, her name is Pam. We call her Pammy Pam. And she's writing right now that her 16-year-old mm -hmm. daughter was watching my show last night. Well, I did my show as a stone character I call Mooney, who we assume is high all the time. Right. And I did it for 420. So instead of being me, I was Mooney the whole time. I put a wig on, I put nose cream, sunglasses, and I look like some guy from the beach. Right. Now, I have somebody like that in my life. I'm actually impersonating somebody. <laughs> and all I talked about was the difference between smoking weed in the 70s and the 80s as opposed to now when you can go down the block and just get it. Mm -hmm. And it made people laugh because you're talking about what's real. Now, there might be somebody who might get offended by that. But what are you going to do? You basically say, you need this weed more than we do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I now, like there that. are and some now, people who don't know when to keep, you know, there are some people probably, you know, in your real life that don't know when to keep their mouth shut. And you feel like uh -huh. saying, hey, don't say that. Don't say that. But when you go to mm -hmm. a comedy club, you can find the common ground, which is basically your own life. You can't get right. mad at me. It's my life. Correct. Yeah, you know? And I agree. My father's like that. He doesn't, I don't talk to him anymore, but my father just never, ever kept quiet. Like he's the person that if you would go to a restaurant, you know that commercial where the guy walks in to help people? There you are. See? It's probably your basement. Okay, we're going to do it again. Okay, FaceTime with Todd Wharton, take three with the wife. Five. 
Back at you. <laughs> All it's right. Probably the basement. Yeah, basements usually tend to say have an in and out of the Wi-Fi. Oh, happens shit, a lot. I'm sorry. I can go upstairs if you need me to. No, no, it's cool. I'm fine. I'm fine. You do you paper show or you do it live? Live. Okay, yeah, you may want to consider that too, because live in basements, remember basements were never meant for Wi-Fi when they were built. Always keep that in your head. That's why there's concrete and all that crap around and then the ceiling. So you may want to consider that just to let you know. All right. Your tip. All right? I think when they built this basement, there was no such thing as Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> They're probably like, Wi-Fi? Is that like uh like a like a new TV with bigger antennas? Is that is that what you're talking about? Dude, when they built this basement, there was no such thing as the phone. <laughs> Oh my God, really? This house is old. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I, is there somebody back there making a fire? <laughs> like, what's, what's going on over there? <laughs> There's antiques all over this house from my family. But when you said before that, that this was real and it's not a prop, everything down here is real. I was somebody was talking to me yesterday, like, where did I get this? And I'm like, this is my great grandmother's, not grandma, great grandma, great grandma. And we used to have this in the house. So if you were doing bad things, say, go talk to Jesus. Imagine being oh five years old and you had to see this in the dark. <laughs> oh, my God. You know where that's from? You just gave me a flashback. Born in East L.A. When, uh, when the Spanish comedian, I forgot his name, he kept, he kept thinking that Jesus was talking to him because he didn't understand English. And it was because he kept hearing the phone ringing. <laughs> And when, he, and when the machine came on, you heard a voice, and that was the Jesus that he was talking to. Is that Freddie <laughs> Prince? No, the other Spanish guy. Um, oh my God, I wish I could. Everybody knows who this guy is. I I wish I. He was in uh, Quicksilver with Kevin Bacon in a biker movie. I forgot the I forgot the guy's name, but I'll I'll figure it out. But yeah, that's it. That's freaky. <laughs> <laughs> that's really really freaky. It was man. Cheech Cheech and Chung. No, it was born in, yes, born in East L.A. with Cheese Marine. That was yeah. the movie. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm saying that because somebody's Marine. writing and saying Cheech from Cheech and Chung. Yes, but who was the Spanish guy that kept praying to Jesus if somebody can answer that question? Look it up because I'm kind of curious about that. But let, let's talk about your name. Um, they call you the Jersey Bad Boy, all right? Who gave you that name and where did that name come about? I have an idea, but. <clears throat> it's actually a, a, a pretty historical thing in my life. Um, when I first started doing stand-up comedy, I was about 29 because I grew up as an actor. I never wanted to be a stand-up. I right. started doing stand-up when I got signed to the comedy store in Los Angeles. Uh, so when I was out there, Paul there Rodriguez. was a, a comedy icon used to come around on Sunday night to rehearse, and I was mm -hmm. the host of the show. So he came up to me one day and he said, I've never seen a blonde, blue-eyed Italian before. That's something new. You should wear a shirt and tie and call yourself either the Golden Guido or New Jersey's bad boy. And I says, okay, I'll do it. And that was Andrew Dice Clay. Oh, my God. <laughs> you get, so you got named from literally a legend that nobody ever did a stand-up like his. His routine was so off the cuff that if you weren't prepped for it, don't go to his show, because that's a show that people can get insulted real quick. But he was funny the way he did the nursery rhymes. Oh, the guy's a legend. He's still doing great. He's touring all over the country. He just He's working on a TV series. I see him from time to time. Uh, but there was a, a bunch of guys in the early 90s hanging around the comedy store, and they called him Brooklyn's bad boy. And... Uh, he met my dad and they were, they bonded a little bit. And then he said, you know, I'm going to help your son out. So he took me on tour and uh, I got to open for him. And it wow. was pretty, pretty amazing and still pretty friendly. Uh, there was a time where I was running around the comedy store and he said, well, why don't we call you a Russian comedian and you don't speak English? <laughs> 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 and that's on tape. So if anybody has a question, I know he's got the tape somewhere. Yeah, I think a lot of people got up to questions. And somebody mentioned the actor, by the way. It's Paul Rodriguez played in that film. Which he, Paul Rodriguez. So thank you. 
Yeah, whoever put that up, I appreciate that because you went up to be. Now you went to the Acad uh, Dramatic School of Arts, correct? Where you yeah. studied. Um, when you were doing that, uh, how was your transition over to comedy? Because um, I took some acting courses. It's a completely different feel. But what I do find is when you do comedy, it actually helps with your acting, especially when it comes to memorization, because it's very hard to do an eight minute skit where you're trying to get people left. Well, like I said, I never wanted to be a stand up comedian. So when I was going through junior high and high school, I was doing all the theater plays that the school provided and I wanted to be an actor. So I started doing TV commercials in New York City. When I was mm -hmm. 18, that's when I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. And boy, they didn't want to know anything about comedy. That's for darn damn sure. And yeah. uh, I was taking deep theatrical acting exercises. So when I was told when I went to California that I had a flair for comedy, I was actually upset and broken hearted. I'm like, I, I trained to be an actor. Right. But then I said to myself, well, what if I was an actor playing the role of a stand-up comic? And that's how I trained myself to become a comedian. And I wasn't being Michael on stage. I was being Mike. And Michael talks like this, but Mike goes like this, excuse me. And that's <laughs> how it got me going. And now yeah, I'm so addicted to stand-up that I, I would prefer to be a live performer than anything else. However, right. I, I do acting still as well. Yeah, well, you did about 200 national commercials, correct? I mean, that's pretty good being an actor. I mean, uh, that's actually amazing. on my resume. I need to update that. I've probably done even more. So I started doing commercials in New York City because, you know, when, you, when you're 15, 16 years old and you have thick blonde hair and blue eyes and you look like the all American boy. You're yeah. doing a chip commercial, you're doing a candy commercial, you're biting into a hamburger. Um, when I was 19, I did one of the biggest campaigns of all time. It was the first time they spent a million dollars on a TV commercial. It was for United Airlines. I played at a Marine coming home from boot camp. Mm -hmm. And it, I got nominated for a best, uh, a Clio best male performer in a TV commercial. Wow, somebody actually just wrote United Airlines. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, Buena Sera. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Buena Sera. Um, you know, what's really funny is it actually got me kicked out of the American Academy. Because in the wow. American Academy, they had a rule that you were not supposed to work as a, a theatrical actor until you right. finished the school. Because right. they wanted to promote the best products out there. And mm -hmm. TV commercials were considered the lowest form of acting. So I guess in 1982, they didn't know that there was going to be a thing called reality shows, which would have been the real low form of acting. So I do this TV commercial. It goes on the air. Everybody thinks I'm a real Marine. And I get nominated for the Clio. I pick up the biggest agency in New York City. And then I get invited to the dean's office at the academy. And they said, you're Private Zaleski, aren't you? And I said, yes. And they said, you got to go. I go, listen, I'm 19 years old. They just handed me $40,000. Uh, are you sure? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's like a man. And it's a shame that they put those stipulations on there because we all know how hard it is for any actor to get any role that paid. So it seems like a lot of these academies are kind of putting strict guidelines on a lot of work that you can actually make them right away. Because as you know and I know, how hard is it to find people that can actually get paid for what they love to do and become a working actor? And commercials for the majority of a lot of people and extra roles and maybe one line here or there, for the majority of the industry, that's a career for people. And for people like that to stop that, and they said, that's not good acting, really? Well, tell that to Mark John Jeffries, who's one of my good friends, who's a baby actor, child act, you know, com commercial, did Losing Isaiah, and now he's got about 25 major feature films, including Eddie Murphy and the whole nine where he started from commercials. That's what I don't understand. I don't get that at all. You know, it's, this is show business, and I don't know what it's like to be in any other business. I've, I've luckily have made my living in the entertainment business since I'm a teenager. So I don't know what it's like to do uh, other stuff. But I did work for my family, of course, in construction from time to time. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, it's difficult. This is very difficult. There's hundreds of us. And then there's people who are not in the business who want to be in the business. And now there's TikTok and whatnot and bing, bang, and boom. And anybody could do anything at any time and surprise. So mm -hmm. you just kind of kind of roll with it. You never know what tomorrow is going to bring. I did learn a big lesson when the pandemic hit that I should just be humble and happy with whatever's given to me. I'll take it. Because before the pandemic, I was crushing it. I had a show every night of the week, booked out a year and a half in advance from cruise ships around the world to playing in Canada, uh, all different. I, I average at least 1,500 people a week. Wow, that's uh, that's really, really impressive. Seriously. And then you stop at nothing. Yeah, and then it's going to be a while. I keep telling people, right now, 2021, to really try to put on big events again, don't do it because you're going to end up losing money. And until we can get this on hold, any big events is going to put us in rewind on what we're trying to do to move forward. That's why I'm telling people, try to wait through 2022, unless it's an outdoor event where you can do social distancing, but it's not worth it because I put off all my events to that because at the end of the day, I want to pay my people. But if I'm only bringing in 25% capacity, I'm not losing money to nobody. I'm, I'm just not. It doesn't even make sense. Yeah. So, you know, I, I definitely, who, whoever is chiming in right now, we are talking to Mike Marino. You can check him out on Instagram, Mike Marino Live. Check him out. You can follow me at Todd Warden Official. I interview celebrities five days a week, and we're wrapping up season one. So I got Mike on my last two weeks. So Mike, <laughs> here's yeah, we it's been incredible, man. I mean, the, the talent that has come on since day one, just an amazing man, amount of people. Now, speaking of comedy, I thought it was kind of funny. How did you end up in soap operas? <laughs> Trying to be a comedic actor, that, that, doesn't even, that doesn't even make sense. That's like, wait, we know we need in one life to live. After the guy dies and he we take his brain out of his head, but then we go to put it back. We should put a comedic doctor or something in there. I think that would be well. And I think people will cry over that. <laughs> like, how did that even happen? It was, I got on the soaps before I got into stand-up comedy. I was in my early 20s. And in New York City, they had these schools that had acting for television and mm -hmm. commercial classes. So when I got the award, well, I got nominated for the award. I actually uh, lost the Clio to Tommy. Um, forgot what his name is, but uh, he was in a TV commercial for Dr. Pepper. I remember going to the awards and everything. And uh, there was a casting director who ran a school and she said, hey, why don't you come into the school and say a few things to the students? Because they're on camera acting. And she was the right. casting director for As the World Turns. Wow. So I never thought I'd be on a soap opera. There's, big nose, goofy looking guy. And, you know, they always had great, gorgeous people. You know, soap operas was for like my mom and stuff like that. But they, they said, hey, could you do a couple of lines in this skit on As the World Turns? So I went down there and I did it. And I only had a couple of lines. It was on there for the day. Then a couple of weeks later, Ryan's Hope, and they wanted me to pretend I was boxing with this other guy. I was just a kid. Oh, you say this, say that. And then I did it. Then another one, then another one. Then all of a sudden, I got called back to go on As the World Turns for a recurring character. And it was with Meg Ryan and Marissa Tomei. And Marissa Tomei must have been 19 years old. I was probably 23. And oh. I, who knew? So like I got on the show. I get a couple of lines with everybody. A week later, hey, everybody likes you. Come back on the show. Come back on the show. Before you know it, I was on As the World Turns for about a year. Me and two other guys were the antagonists to Marissa Tomei and her friends, whatever it was, on the show. At the end of the year, I got offered to go to Italy for three weeks to make a TV commercial for Join the Navy, See the World, and I would become the national spokesperson for the Navy. So I said, goodbye, as the world turns. And I went out to Italy. I did the commercial with another actor. And uh, the Achille Laurel got hijacked out of Rome or Gaeta. 
and they canceled all the ad campaigns. Well, while I was gone, what did they do to my character on As the World Turns? They put him in jail. <laughs> <laughs> I got screwed like you have no idea. And that's a true story. <laughs> and I used that... to see, I used to see uh, Marissa at her boyfriend's parties all the time because I was friends with all those guys. But who would have thought all the years would go by, I'd become a comedian, she'd become an Oscar winner. Oh, my God. And, and these are true stories. Person. I actually have footage of this on VHS. Oh, <laughs> uh, you got to You have to read. You know, you have to go to a store and get that digitized so you can post it. That would be an amazing post for people to watch. Yeah, right. That would go viral. <laughs> oh, my God. You should definitely get that. I would do that in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat like that. Now, you appeared on a lot of great things. One of the things that really caught my eye was you appeared on The Tonight Show. And yeah. to any... Any person in the world, when you appear on a show like that, you pretty much have reached your mark, like you're there. That That's when everybody knows. Now, when you were on a Tonight Show, was it Johnny Carson or was it Jay Leno? Jay Leno. Jay Leno. All right. Now, I always wanted to ask, he seemed really fun. I'm, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of Leno. He was good. You know, I like more of the comedic guys like Carson I like and Conan and, you know, the Fowls and everybody. Uh, how was your experience on Jay Leno's show? Another one of those weird stories in showbiz. I wanted to do stand-up comedy on The Tonight Show. And they were having these uh, casting sessions where you would go down there, you pay a certain amount of money, and you take the class, and you audition for The Tonight Show. But I didn't know that it was the casting director who does sketch comedy on The Tonight Show. Right. But I did it anyway. And the guy said to me, his name was Scott Atwell. He was the casting director at NBC. And he says, well, I don't cast the stand-ups, but I think you're fantastic. And if I can get you some sketch comedy on The Tonight Show, you might break your way into stand-up. So I figured, well, okay, I'll give it a shot. And about a week went by. I went down to The Tonight Show, and I did a scene with Jay. I was all nervous. I didn't say nothing about anything. And it went on television, and everybody was calling me going, oh, my God, you were on The Tonight Show. I go, yeah, I know, but I didn't do stand-up. I did a skit. Yeah, but you're on The Tonight Show. And I go, okay. And then again and again and again. And two years goes by, and I never told anybody I was a stand-up comic. I remember wow. one time I was doing a skit on the show. It was a live skit. And somebody in the audience goes, hey, ain't you Mike Marino? I'm like, shh, nobody's supposed to know I'm here. And I uh, ended up opening for Jay at a corporate event. And he even said to me, he goes, what are you doing here? I said, I'm your opening act. He goes, you do stand-up? And I go, well, that's kind of how I got on the show. So another year, another year, never let me do stand-up on The Tonight Show. And my first stand-up appearance on television was on The Martin Short Show. Wow. And they were in two different areas. Mm -hmm. So when I went to The Tonight Show to do a skit, the stage manager said to me, I saw you doing stand-up last night on The Martin Short Show. And I said, yeah. She goes, well, why don't you just do stand-up here on our show? And I'm like, do you all talk to each other? Yeah, that's one of the things I notice in this industry that if one person likes it, there is no communication amongst anybody. And it's really, really frustrating because, I mean, Jay Leno saw you and he thought you were great, obviously. But it's like, guys, Martin Short just had him on. Like, we've had this guy for years. Like, why do we just miss out on this? Like, this is our fault. Because even though you got the call to be a stand up on that show, they're probably looking all at each other like, what are we, a bunch of morons? Like, we've had this guy for years, and he could have been, we could have pretty much said he became famous because of us from stand-up, but Martin Shorten got the kick. Like, it doesn't even make sense because of communication. And I was getting back to that in the beginning. There's no communication. The art of communication, especially in the industry, is dead. You talk to a publicist, Half the time, they don't get you the stuff you want, or they don't return your phone call. Then the manager's like, yeah, I'll reach out to the publicist. Never reaches out. And then it's, who's telling the truth? <laughs> and then it gets to the point, you went to the horse's mouth, and Jay's like, wait, you do stand-up? Be like, yeah, Jay, I do. 
You know, I'm glad that you're saying this because sometimes I feel like I'm all alone and I'm the only one that goes through this. And I, I just want to bang my head against the cellar stone. And I, I get so frustrated because you could talk to people and you feel like going, did you do any research on who I am at all? No. Whereas I'm talking to you and I'm like, man, this guy really did his research. You dug deep. <laughs> yeah. I, um, one of the things that I do, I mean, if you happen to look me up again, it's not a big deal. I'm, I'm very anal when it comes to preparation. Um, I run New York City's Peace Concert. Um, I've been doing events for years and, you know, it led me into this celebrity world, which I'm not a celebrity. I'm just a worker. But the one thing I've realized is that my talk show, what I did years ago, and I redid it for this, it's taken off. And I built such a great rapport with a lot of great people in all industries that the one respect I have is if somebody's coming on my show, right, it's an honor for me, no matter who it is. And the least I can do is do my research on everything, look at everything you sent me. So when I come to the interview, there's never a dead moment. Um, because there should never be a dead moment. It's about that camaraderie and the comfortableness. And listen, man, when I when I bring when I bring people in, you damn right I'm gonna do my research because I'm insulting you if I don't even know who the heck you are. What am I gonna do? Ask you the five questions. So how do you like being a comic? I saw you did this. So how um um how do you like being a comic? Um um you really like comedy? And after a while, you're just like you know this is, this is the skit right here. This yeah. is the skit right here. No problem. But it's very important, and that's why conversations get comfortable in interviews. Interviews are supposed to be funny, comfortable conversation. That's yeah. it. Where you could take it anywhere. You know, and speaking of taking it anywhere, what I loved is um, you created this skit um, that you use on your comedy, which I actually watched three times today. So I thought it was hilarious. The Make America Italian Again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right when I saw the title, I'm like, all right, this is going to be some funny crap. So I got to watch this. Now, when I was watching it, the things that you put in there were hilarious, where there was one part, I think, where you said, you know that sign at the airport when it says, see something, say something? And you're like, and because it's Italian, you're like, you didn't see nothing. They keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you know, I was laughing my ass off. But you know what I love? When you come up with a great idea, you turned it into a web series. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Tell me about the web series because I love new types of web series based on comedy because that's how, uh, you know, uh, Jerry Seinfeld got a show and Tim Allen and a lot of these other guys based in their own comedy. I think that a parody on The Sopranos, but kind of like the Italian president type of deal all mixed into one. I think that's pretty dope. How'd you come up with all these ideas? Uh, a bunch of years ago. Uh, they were doing Comics Unleashed. And I couldn't get on the show for about a year because the casting director didn't like me. Another horror story. Then they have the doorman from the Laugh Factory gets the job, and he's my buddy. So I get to go on the show. And it was just one of those things where I said, you know, if we had an Italian president, we never would have sent the Army, the Navy, or the Marine Corps to find Osama bin Laden. Two hitmen from Jersey would come back in 24 hours. And the world went nuts. Yeah. And I'd say they'd walk in there, they'd sit him down like it was a conversation, like, hey, Ben, you know, I'm a little mad I had to come here. You live very far from New Jersey. And the people were going crazy. And then I said, take them out and let's leave with the rugs. And people were going nuts. Got like 14 million views on the Internet. And this is before... Uh, um, uh, YouTube was big. So then I figured, well, what if I get some of my comedy friends that I admire and we're going on the road What if we're at night during the day? Why don't we come up with an idea like a spoof on the Sopranos of us running for president of the United States? Yeah. So I started Great. calling up all my guys and this, that, and the other thing. And we were mimicking every mob project you've ever seen through the eyes of a bunch of knuckleheads. And I yeah. have a great director, uh, Cody, who knew exactly how to put the comedy in the juices in it. And my producer, who happens to be his wife, Tatiana Bouchel, she does all my social media. And she created, we had such a great mind of people. And mm -hmm. the chemistry was so much fun wherever we went that we filmed it. 
and we ended up selling it. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, we'd have made the pilot of a new generation going for the White House. But we had to stop because we can't be around each other and the tour stopped. But I'm so really, sold, yeah, I'm, really sold, right? I'm really hoping now, slowly but surely, I can make a brand new pilot about what we want to do. And I know it's going to be a hit. I know it's going to be yeah. a hit. Just talking to you right now, I see myself in the pilot with a bunch of hitmen talking yeah. to you about why we know we can run the country. <laughs> exactly. I would listen. If you want a reporter to do that, I I'm down 100%. I mean, I do that a lot. Be um, like an ongoing guy that we like you and we want you to be part of us. Like yeah, you, answer, you. you ask a question, we go, nah, well, I can't answer that. <laughs> I, I could be that one reporter that is kind of like you're in, like when people have cops in their payroll, I'll be your reporter on your payroll. Yeah. It's like telling yeah. you the scoops. Right? It, it all just writes itself. On. We were having so much fun doing it. We were actually performing, me and three of the other comedians who were in the series, at the yeah. Tropicana in Las Vegas. So I said, all right, let's get in the car. We'll drive out towards the desert, but you could see the backdrop of Las Vegas, which included the Luxor. So we're standing in the desert. I'm touching my clothes like with suits on, like we went to go see Osama bin Laden. And I'm talking to on the phone and I'm like, I want him dead and I want you to crucify him. I want you to kill him. I want this and I want that. Mom, no, we're not hungry. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And then I said to the one guy, I go, you told me this is where he is. He goes, I didn't say this is where he is. You said he's in the desert. And I go, okay, but is this the right desert? He goes, well, there's the pyramid, and it's the Luxor. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is something you can really take years and years and make America Italian again. Oh, my God. It's a great, great concept. And listen, with the COVID thing, you can add so many funny things. Just about mob guys walking around with masks, and a guy's like, what are you doing? I don't want to touch him. Maybe he's dirty. Oh, yeah. We just killed him. It's like we just killed the mofo. Take your it's mask off. COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, you could write so much great stuff. And it's unlimited because the one thing about politics that I know, politics make everything better for comedians. Oh, they yeah. Just do. They just do. Now, what people don't realize in getting back to the sensitivity of people, there are two really important jobs in this world right now when it comes to news besides reporters don't give it up being a reporter is awesome comedians and talk show hosts and the yeah. reason why i'm saying that more people will listen to a comedian talk about a real topic in a funny way because the world's too serious and, they, and they'll be like yo that makes sense and they'll laugh than they would watching cnn for 10 minutes um people are more drawn to drama and funny and that's why guys like you are very important because you can take real life instances, put it into your show, and it will get higher ratings because that's how people remember real life stories by remembering a comedic show. And it works. Good point. Yeah, and it works. And your show, listen, I want to see that bad boy on Netflix. I really do. I, I think it's funny. As, I think it's crazy funny or Hulu, whatever. Um, that's something where I would definitely want to watch a new seat. I think it's great. And I guarantee you there's a lot of great Italian actors out there that I think would love to be a part of it. Even the serious actors from The Sopranos, I think they would jump all over that just to be yeah. able for a few minutes. Well, I've been lucky enough to do work with uh, Robert Davi. He's, he, does, he sings, and he and I did a bunch of shows together, and we became really good friends, and I know he would – help out if we were going into production and I have some ties to Joe Montaigne and a bunch of other uh, pretty well-known actors and I, I know they would get into it with me. I just, you don't play that card until you're ready to really do what you want to do. Yeah, and with COVID right now, COVID's the perfect opportunity for you to really write a plethora worth of shows and then once COVID starts popping out, you can just slowly start taping them and then go from there. I, I can see you definitely pulling it off. I think it would be great. You have a nice I want to. Okay. The one thing that was great about it is we were actually having fun and we all looked forward to going to work. Like, let's say the Clemenza 
in our project was Greek and he's from Canada. I saw so that. Yeah. You did the scene about the pizza guy comes over and well, knocks at the, door, at the door. He goes, how did you know where we were? That's the joke. He goes, yeah. well, the pizza guy. I know where everybody is. And I look at the fat guy and he goes like, well, what are you looking at me for? And I go, well, did you order it? He goes, no, but why would you think it's me? And we're like, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the best part. That's what I'm saying. You could, you could put a parody on everything. The best parodies in the world is when you take something so serious and you put a flip on it. Yeah. And you make it funny. And you could do that between The Sopranos, The Goodfellas, crazy Italian movies, Scarface, even going way back to a funny one called Spike and Bensonhurst. You could take all these different things and really implement it into a new show and people will absolutely love it. And that's why shows like uh, like Scary Movie that yeah. trilogy that. Yes. The reason why it's so good is they took real movies and make comedic stuff out of it. In your case, Make America Italian Again is so funny, just a name, but you're leaving it open where you can do anything that you want, like anything in the world. And I think that would be hilarious. Like Angel Salazar's skit where he did like, you know, with the Spanish people, with you, you could be like, you know, we had uh, we had two pretty much mobs on the block. We we had the, I, I think uh, I, I forgot how he put it. He says, "Oh, we had the warlord, and then we had the Jewish gang, the landlord, and they owned everything." <laughs> you know, you could do so much stuff like that based on Italians. I'm telling you, man, I would love to watch this thing. I really hope you do it. We'll make it happen. Yeah, I think so. So we have a few minutes left. So what do you have coming up? Do you have anything booked in stand-up? Or are you pretty much staying home right now and no, waiting out the COVID? I just finished two weeks in Florida. Everything was open up at about 80%. And here in New Jersey this Friday night, I'm going to be at the mansion in Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. My opening mm -hmm. act is a singer. His name is Vinny Madunio. So he's going to be doing some, some Sinatra and some Dean right. Martin. Uh, it's going to be hosted by Joe Causey. And then I'll go on stage. So that's at the Mansion in Mountain Lakes this Friday night, April 23. They still got tickets left. You can go to MikeMarino.net and find out how to get in. Um, Saturday night, I'm going to the Putnam Golf Event Center, which is Mopac, New York. Right. And then uh, Sunday night, I do the last Sunday of every month, the Not So Late Show with me, Mike Marino, which is a sketch show like The Tonight Show. I do a mm -hmm. monologue. I invite a comedian on to the show. I have a singer on the show. We do some skits together, and then we say goodnight. We charge $4.99. <laughs> oh, that's great. Now, you're going live in a little bit, right? You're doing the show tonight? Is that correct? No, my show was last night. Tonight, I'm okay. just with you. When we're done talking, I'm going to go get myself some raviolis. <laughs> oh, my own. Okay, I got you. <laughs> well, 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 <laughs> well, when we're done, this interview is going to be available on Instagram within five minutes. I'm going to get it right up. And you'll be able to share it. And people, obviously, that couldn't be on here can definitely rewatch it. That's the great thing about this. After the live, it allows people to see it forever, which is great. And you know I'm more than happy to have you come back on because when I get my studio, which is where we're moving to, hopefully, after the pandemic, I would love to have you on and do a stand-up comedy routine. You got it. I would love story. to do that. Yeah, we'll have a lot of fun with that. But... uh Mike, thank you, man. I wish we had more hours to talk because I have a feeling I mean you can talk for hours because we only hit the, the tip of everything that you did. And you've done so much from hosting film festivals, awards, stand-up, traveling, got these new shows. But guys, definitely check this guy out, Mike Marino Live on Instagram. And look out, look out. I'm telling you, I can see this popping. Make, it, make America Italian again. I can see the shirts popping at the San Gennaro <laughs> Festival. You walking down the parades like, yo, that's Mike Marino. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. It's backwards. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I want to see a skit in the San Gennaro Festival and somebody takes somebody out of Ferraris, but then you're like, you know what? While we're here, let's get a box of cannoli. Like, <laughs> and then you leave. I would love it. I would love let's it. Let's pray that this coming October, September, that they actually have the Feast of San Gennaro again. I hope, I hope, I hope. Well, if they do and you're coming to New York, you better let me know because I'm not too far. All right. All right, buddy. Yes. So, Mike, right. thank you for coming on. And 
Uh, guys, give it up to Mike Miriam for being on the show. And why he's here, let me tell you about tomorrow night. I have a great person coming on tomorrow night, Kathleen Trigg. She's an Emmy-winning journalist, uh, producer, and talk show host turned actors who was seen on Power and House of Cards. And then Friday, we have New York State Senator Leroy Tomlin is going to be in the house, and we're going to talk about uh, what just happened with the uh, Chauvin case, because everybody knows I work alongside with Ben Crop on a lot of the rallies, so we're going to talk about that as well. So to everybody out there, please wear your mask, practice social distancing, because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. And as I always say to all my guests and my virtual audience, if you're not living a passionate life, then whose life are you living? All right, guys, have a great night, and I'll see you tomorrow. Mike, take care, brother.